Happy Monday, everybody. I'm back. Um, today, I'm going to read chapters 9 and 10 of Lincoln's Grave Robbers. And when we left off, um, they were talking about how they thought everything was coming together pretty well. And they felt really confident in their plan to um, steal Lincoln's body. So, chapter 9. Last details. Tyrell kept sending daily reports to Chief Brooks and kept waiting for a response. On October 31st, he wrote, Swuggles informs me this day that two men of the gang to remove the remains of President Lincoln are to visit the monument grounds this week and arrange their plans and bring them to a close at an early day. The rising tension comes through in Tyrell's written words. I have no instructions to this matter, what to do or how to act. Please inform me as soon as possible. Shall I act or not? Now, remember Tyrell worked for the Secret Service, so at that time, his job was only to stop counterfeit money. So really, it wasn't even his job to worry himself about um, them stealing Lincoln's body. The next day, still no word from the chief. Meanwhile, the plot was moving forward. This morning at 10 o'clock, Tyrell reported, I met Louis C. Swaggles, who informs me that the gang are consulting on the best means to evade detection after they remove President Lincoln's remains from the monument in Springfield. The plan, Swuggles told Tyrell, was for him and Billy Brown to head north and slip across the border into Canada. We were to remain there and to be supplied with money to pay our expenses, said Swuggles. Hughes and Mullen would come back to Chicago and lie low while Kennelly negotiated for the return of Lincoln. Swuggles gave Tyrell one additional fact, a strange one. The party intends that Miss Boyd will pay all expenses. Turns out Hughes and Mullen were having trouble pulling together the cash they'd need for travel expenses. They had been out of Coney for some time and couldn't raise much money, Swaggles recalled. It occurred to them that the whole point of this job was to free Ben Boyd, so they decided to hit up his wife, Allie, who was living in Chicago. They met with her and made their pitch. She told them she wanted nothing to do with the plot and insisted they leave her husband out of their wacky-sounding scheme. Allie Boyd did not think her husband would approve. In fact, Ben Boyd was sitting in prison without any idea of the elaborate efforts being made to win his freedom. Still, Tyrell waited. Chief, I wish you would inform me what action I should take in this Lincoln Monument matter, he wrote on November 2nd. If Tyrell was going to foil the Lincoln plot, he needed the go-ahead. Also, he needed permission to spend a little extra money on train fare and hotels. It would be attended with considerable expense, which I will not incur without your authority. That same day, Brooks finally replied, though he still didn't take the plot too seriously. Go ahead, he told Tyrell. Try to get to the bottom of things. Late that night, Sleggles, Hughes, Mullen, and Billy Brown met at the hub to review the plan. At some point, Mullen ran out to a newsstand and picked up a copy of the Catholic Union and Times, a London newspaper. Back at the saloon, he pulled, up the fr pulled off the front page of the paper and tore it in two diagonally. He stepped behind the bar, lifted the bust of Abraham Lincoln from its shelf, and shoved one half of the paper into the hollow plaster head. This half would stay hidden in the hub. The other half he stuffed into his pocket to take along on the job and leave in Lincoln's tomb. This was all part of Big Jim's plot. At the site of the Lincoln job, the police would find half of the front page of the Catholic Union and Times. When Big Jim Kennelly approached government officials to negotiate for the return of Lincoln's body, they would demand evidence that Kennelly really had the body. Kennelly could provide the other half of the newspaper, the one hidden in the hub. It, its ripped edges would fit perfectly together with the half left in Lincoln's tomb. That would give him some standing with the government officials, Swaggles, Swaggles explained. It would prove Kennelly was in close touch with the body snatchers. The hub gang was convinced there would be no other evidence linking them to the crime. Oh, what a desperate undertaking, Tyrell wrote in his report to Brooks. I think, Chief, there is no doubt about these people's being in earnest. They really intend to try and accomplish their intentions and thereby gain a national reputation. It is talked of with a spirit of pride by the man Mullen. He is elated with the prospect of negotiating for the return of President Lincoln's remains and thereby secure about $200,000 and the release of Ben Boyd for further use in counterfeiting. Only one important detail remained, the date of the job. 
Tyrell knew this. He couldn't eat, or, sorry, he couldn't set his trap at the monument. And he could only get the information from one place. On November 5th, Tyrell wrote, I tried to find Swaggles this day, but could not. Swaggles was too busy to check in with Tyrell. He and the Hub gang were holed up in his apartment trying to pick a date for the Lincoln job. They figured about two more weeks would be enough time to, be, to get settled in Springfield and take care of last minute preparations. But we talked that over, Swaggles recalled, and came to the conclusion that if we waited so long, there would be too much ice and perhaps snow on the ground and it would probably be frozen. After stealing the body, they'd have to dig a deep hole to plant the casket. Frozen soil would be a major hassle. I don't like to dig snow, Hughes grumbled. Someone suggested election night, November 7th, just two days off. They talked it over and saw the advantages. The Lincoln Monument would be deserted. Everyone would be in town, voting and then waiting for election results to come into the newspaper offices by telegraph. And later that night, as they sped off with Lincoln's casket, the roads would be conveniently busy. A wagon going along the road at night would not be noticed. Swaggles later explained, since those who saw it would think it contained farmers going home from the polls. They all agreed election night it was. The meeting finally broke up at 2 a.m. November 6th. The plan was to meet at the Chicago and Alton Depot that night, a few minutes before 9, to catch the late train to Springfield. The morning of November 6th was windy and cold. After just a few hours of sleep, Swaggles found Tyrell and gave him the update. Tyrell told Swaggles to go ahead exactly as if they were as if he were really part of the Hub gang. When the thieves got to the monument the next night, Tyrell would be waiting for them. The Secret Service spent the day running around Chicago, making final arrangements. At the Palmer House, Tyrell met his former boss, Elmer Washburn. Washburn wasn't, the, wasn't with the Bureau anymore, but he agreed to help out any way he could. They went to Robert Lincoln's office, told him the latest news, and assured him that his father's remains would not be disturbed. Robert agreed to telegraph John Stewart, chairman of the Lincoln Monument Association, asking him to meet Tyrell in Springfield in the morning. Knowing that there was four persons in the gang, Tyrell reported, I needed more help. So Tyrell and Washburn hurried to the offices of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency and met with the founder, Alan Pinkerton. Pinkerton loaned the Secret Service two of his best private eyes, John McGinn and George Hay. Tyrell next dashed off a telegram to John McDonald, the Secret Service agent who'd helped him call her Ben Boyd the year before. McDonald was working in Joliet, I guess is how you'd say that. Tyrell told him to get on a train for Springfield. He also found time to send an update to Washington. It's clear from Tyrell's wording that his boss still wasn't convinced the Lincoln plot was real. You think, as I did, that there was no human being so foul as to conceive such a horrible act, Tyrell wrote to Chief Brooks, but sir, I'm sorry to say that there is. All right, and chapter 10, overnight train. When Tyrell, Washburn, and the two private detectives met at the Palmer House that night, the wide street in front of the hotel was lit by the dancing flames of torches. A large group marched past holding torches high, shouting the name of their candidate for president, Samuel J. Tilden. On a nearby street, another huge crowd bellowed the name of their man, Rutherford B. Hayes. A little after 8 p.m., Tyrell and his team climbed into a wagon and drove toward the train station. Along the way, as arranged, Swaggles jumped in for a quick consultation. Everything was on schedule, he told Tyrell. The hub gang would meet at the station and take the 9 o'clock train, riding the first car. Tyrell handed Swaggles $15. Swaggles jumped out and hurried toward the station on foot. The detective, John McGinn, waited a moment, then leaped out and followed the roper down the dark street. I requested Mr. McGinn to pipe Swaggles, reported Tyrell, and note the people he would consult with and see where they would go. A smart precaution. Tyrell could not allow Hughes and Mullen to slip out of his sight now. The wagon continued to the station. Passengers were already boarding the Springfield train. Tyrell walked into the shadows near the door of the car and waited. He, kept, he checked his watch a few minutes before nine. He eyed the platform. Five minutes passed. Steel wheels groaned and clanked against the tracks as the train slowly started rolling. Tyrell must have felt a flash of panic. Had Swaggles been wrong? Mis misled him? Were the Coney men already a step ahead? 
Then he, sm he spotted a small group darting toward the moving train. Mullen, Hughes, Swaggles, and Billy Brown jumped onto the front passenger car. Tyrell and the detectives leaped up the steps of the back car. They found seats and settled in for the 200-mile ride to Springfield. It was not a restful journey. With those fiends aboard, <clears throat> Tyrell jotted in his notebook, actions may end in death. I fully realize the importance of our journey, Chief, and rest assured, sir, we will do our whole duty. Mullen sat in the front car, a big bag of tools between his feet. Hughes sat beside him. Swaggles suggested that maybe they shouldn't all ride together. Four men together might prove singular, he said, too memorable to potential witnesses if things went wrong. He and Brown walked back to the next car. This was a little detail worked out between the Roper and his friend. Billy Brown had absolutely no intention of going to Springfield and getting mixed up in the tomb break-in. When the train slowed down to pass through Burling Burlington, he jumped off. From the side of the tracks, Brown watched the red light hanging from the caboose string shrink and vanish. He headed back toward Chicago and once again became Bill Neely, the law-abiding bricklayer. Spiegel strolled to the front car and reported that the cracksman was sound asleep. And um, this on on this next page is a picture of the tools um, that were between his feet, and that's the tools that they used for the break-in, the set of tools that they used. The train pulled into Springfield at 6 a.m. on November 7th. It was still dark, and an icy wind whipped through the station. Hughes stepped onto the platform and pulled his blue overcoat around him. Mullen followed, wrapped in a long raincoat, carrying his heavy bag. Swaggles told them Billy Brown was still in the next car sleeping. He said he'd go wake the cracksmen before the train left the station at 7 a.m. The three men walked into town, found a restaurant that was already open early, and ordered breakfast. When they stepped back outside, the sky was beginning to lighten from black to wet gray. They walked through town toward a saloon called the Germania House. Mullen held up the bag full of tools. He handed them to me, Swaggles later said, and told me to take them into a lager beer saloon and say to the bartender that my friend wasn't up and ask him to keep the bag until I called for it. The two Coney men preferred not to be seen with the tools, given what they were about to be used for. Of course, Swaggles knew he was being taken advantage of, but he was pretty sure he'd get the last laugh. When Swaggles came back out, the men walked to the St. Charles House, a small hotel. They were very tired, remembered Swaggles. I told them I would go downtown and wake Brown. Mullen said, you had better let him go to one of the towns four or five miles out and hire a rig. Swaggles agreed. The plan was to have Brown bring a wagon to the cemetery that night for the getaway. Mullen and Hughes entered the hotel and registered as T. Durnan, Durnan and James Smith. Mullen asked the manager to wake them at 10.30 a.m. and they went up to their room. If the Coney men were watching from the window, they saw their partner walking in the direction of their train of the train station. When Swaggles was a few blocks from the hotel, well out of view, he doubled back toward St. Nicholas Hotel, just two blocks from the St. Charles. He went in and asked the clerk for the room number of a guest named Mr. DeMorris. And that's it for today. So, hmm, I feel like there are some un- um, announced disloyalties that are about to take place. I don't think all three men are on the same page, and I don't think that any of them can be trusted. So, we'll find out tomorrow. Bye, guys.